Stephen Port, aka The Grinder Killer, is a notorious British serial rapist and killer. Port met his victims through online gay and bisexual social networks, dating and hookup apps such as Grinder. When meeting his victims, he used gamma hydroxybutyric acid, or GHB, a date rape drug, to incapacitate and rape them. Port also murdered four of his victims in his flat in Barking. Born in Southend-on-Sea, Essex, and moved to Dagenham, East London, with his family when he was a one-year-old. As a child, Port was described as a loner and was often bullied at school. After leaving school, Port went to art college, but it was too expensive for his parents, and so he trained as a chef instead. When Port was in his mid-twenties, he came out as gay. He continued to live with his parents until his early 30s. An ex-partner of Port's described his personality as childish and confirmed this was the reason they broke up. Port's strange behaviour was noticed again when he moved into his own flat in Barking, London. Port's neighbour, Ryan Edwards, claimed he was concerned about Port's behaviour, describing him as creepy and odd. Edwards and Port had struck up a friendship, not only due to being neighbours, but also as they were both members of Barking's LGBT community. Edwards said that Port had a voracious appetite for meeting very young men, and Port would often invite him over to meet his new partners. Edwards claimed this gave him cause for concern, as Port would often introduce him to very young men aged around 16 to 17, who were usually vulnerable in some way and needing somewhere to stay due to difficult circumstances or broken homes. Edwards also claimed Port loved to play with children's toys, such as Transformers. As mentioned earlier, Port sought out his victims through various websites or dating apps. Whilst known as the Grinder Killer, Port used other apps such as Sleepy Boys, Hornet, Fit Lads, Badoo, Gaydar, Flirt, Daddy Hunt, Planet Romeo, Manhunt, Slave Boys, and Couchsurfing. Port lied about himself in his online biographies. In one, he claimed to have graduated from Oxford University and served in the Royal Navy, and in another, he said he was a special needs teacher. Port's first victim was Anthony Woolgate, a 23-year-old fashion student originally from Hull. Woolgate worked as an escort, and Port contacted him on the 17th of June 2014 via Sleepy Boys, pretending to be a client, and offered him £800 for his services. Port and Woolgate met at Barking Station and returned to Port's flat, where Port drugged Woolgate with GHB and raped him. Walgate died due to a fatal overdose of the GHB. In the early hours of 19th June, Port dragged Walgate's body outside his flat and called an ambulance, using his own mobile phone. Remaining anonymous, Port told the operator that he had been driving past and saw a young boy who was collapsed or had a seizure or who was drunk on the street. Port then returned to his flat. On the 26th of June, Port was arrested after police discovered he had hired Walgate as an escort. Port concocted a web of lies in his interview and constantly changed his story. He settled on admitting he had hired Walgate as an escort, but claiming he left him in bed and returned to find him rigid and panicked. Port's flat was searched and police found a bottle of Amsterdam Gold poppers on Port's bedside table and another bottle of poppers in the fridge. They also found an empty bottle of baby oil, a dildo, condoms, lubricating gel and several porn DVDs. Shockingly, Port was only charged with perverting the course of justice by making a false police statement and he was released on bail. 
On 23rd of March, 2015, Port pleaded guilty to perverting the course of justice and was sentenced to eight months imprisonment. However, he was released with an electronic tag on the 4th of June. Walgate's mother, Sarah Sack, repeatedly told police she believed Port murdered her son, but was told several times there was nothing to investigate. Between August 2014 and September 2015, Port went on to murder three more men, Gabriel Kavari, Daniel Whitworth and Jack Taylor. Kavari, a fashion student who had moved to London from Slovakia, was 22 years old. Kavari briefly lived with Port, going to stay with him on the 23rd of August 2014. During this time, Port introduced Kavari to his aforementioned neighbour, Ryan Edwards. The day after they met, Kavari told Edwards that Port was not the man you think he is and that he wasn't a nice man. Edwards offered Kavari to stay at his place, but Kavari never replied. Then, on the 28th of August, Kavari's body was found by a passerby walking her dog, propped up in the graveyard of the St. Margaret of Antioch Church, just 500 metres from Port's flat. Port lied to his neighbour, telling Edwards that Kavari had moved to Spain. Port's sickening behaviour did not end there. He created a fake Facebook profile with the name John Luck and contacted Kavari's boyfriend, Thierry Amodio. During their conversation, John Luck claimed to have had sex with Kavari before his death and pretended to be grieving. A callous move in an attempt to gain information on the police investigation. Whitworth, from Gravesend, Kent, was 21 years old and worked as a chef. He had arranged to meet Port on the 18th of September 2014 in Barking, but just two days later, on 20th September, Whitworth's body was found also propped up in the graveyard of St. Margaret's Church, coincidentally by the same woman who found Kavari. Port had placed a fake suicide note in Whitworth's left hand, claiming he had killed Kavari and then himself out of guilt. The police never checked with Whitworth's family to see whether the letter was genuine, so it was not considered suspicious. If they had checked, they would have realised Kavari and Whitworth did not know each other, and Whitworth was not even embarking when Kavari died. Taylor, who lived with his parents in Dagenham, was 25 years old and worked as a forklift driver. Taylor and Port were talking on Grinder in the early hours of 13th of September 2015, and Taylor travelled to Barking, arriving at 3am. Taylor's body was found the next day, in the same position as Kavari and Whitworth, in a park adjacent to the graveyard. The police failed to make any connection between the deaths of these three men, despite the similarities, and ruled them as drug overdoses. Between 2012 to 2015, Port also drugged and sexually assaulted 12 other victims. On the 15th of October 2015, Port was identified on CCTV walking with Taylor near Barking Station shortly before Taylor's death and was arrested. Port was charged with four counts of murder and four counts of administering a poison with intent to endanger life or inflict grievous bodily harm. In November 2016, Port's case went to trial and he was found guilty by jury of all four murders. In total, the jury convicted Port of a total of 22 offences against 11 men, including the four murders, four rapes, four sexual assaults and 10 counts of administering a substance with intent. Port was cleared on three counts of rape. Port was sentenced at the Old Bailey, London, where he received a life sentence for the murders of Anthony Walgate Gabriel Kavari, Daniel Whitworth, and Jack Taylor. Port received an additional 22 years for each of the four counts of rape and 10 years for each of the 10 counts of administering a substance with intent. 
relatives of the victims clapped and cheered as the sentence was read out. Port remained emotionless as statements from the victims' families were read out. The judge said Port had carried out the murders to satisfy his lust and described the attempt to cover up two of his murders with the fake suicide note as wicked and monstrous. The police failed to properly investigate and, as a result, Port was allowed to continue his callous attacks. They failed to carry out basic checks, send evidence to be forensically examined, and exercise professional curiosity. Police did not initially link the deaths of Kavari and Whitworth, despite the striking similarities. They only started to treat the deaths as suspicious following Taylor's murder. Kavari's previous landlord phoned the police himself, demanding to know if they were linking the cases, but was told they were not linked and not murder. He also offered to come in to be interviewed, as he believed he held information on Kavari's last movements, but no one followed up on his offer. The police also did not initially link any of the deaths to port. If they had sent items, such as the bedsheet Wallgate was wrapped in, for forensic examination, Port's DNA would have been found. The proximity of the location of the three bodies to Port's flat, and the fact another young man linked to Port had died in suspicious circumstances not that long before, was apparently not enough to incite police to investigate Port. The ambulance driver who arrived to find Woolgate's body described it as an unexplained suspicious death. The first police officer to arrive declared it a critical incident and also said it was suspicious. There was bruising underneath Anthony's arms, and despite the fact that his body had obviously been moved, forensics labelled his death as probably non-suspicious. Requests for a specialist homicide team to take over the case were denied. Whitworth's stepmother said when she was informed of his death, she was led to believe it was a drug overdose, despite no investigation having taken place. A small piece of Whitworth's supposed suicide letter was sent to his father and stepmother to verify whether it was his handwriting. They said they were unsure, but police recorded this as confirmation that it was Whitworth's handwriting. It was never submitted for expert analysis. When they were later shown the full letter, Whitworth's father immediately said there was nothing to indicate it had been written by Whitworth. Taylor's family were simply told by police, Jack's dead. The police had accepted the syringe in Jack's pocket, the white powder in his wallet, and the needle marks on his arm as enough evidence of an overdose. However, Taylor was very anti-drugs. Despite this, no investigation took place. The police also failed to interview crucial witnesses, such as Port's neighbour. Following Port's conviction, the Independent Office for Police Conduct opened an investigation as to whether 17 police officers should face disciplinary action, but found none of them had breached professional standards to justify disciplinary proceedings. However, as a result of their inquest, they reopened the investigation with a new team in place due to the systemic failings the investigation identified. Officers denied accusations of prejudice and homophobia, blaming mistakes on being understaffed and lacking resources. The families of Port's victims opened a civil claim against the Metropolitan Police, from which they have received compensation.